a new year and a new season of Hauda's Career Info, the program where career professionals from across the globe meet to empower you to succeed. This program is brought to you by Right Career Fit, and I am Hoda, your host. Today's episode is a new version of Hoda's Career Info, Career Info 2.0, where guests will focus on specific career terminologies, assessments, and or issues. Today's episode, you will meet Dr. Mike Rucker. Mike is an organizational psychologist, behavioral scientist, and charter member of the International Positive Psychology Association. He has been academically published in publications like the International Journal of Workplace Health Management. His ideas about fun and health have been featured in the Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, Fast Company, Psychology Today, Forbes, and more. He currently serves as a senior leader at Active Wellness and is the author of the book, The Fun Habit, which is out now and we will be discussing in this episode. Welcome, Dr. Mike Rucker to Hodes Career Info. I appreciate your time and I'm looking forward to a very good discussion about your book, The Fun Habit. Thank you so much for having me. Mike, you recently released the book and it's grounded in research and you promised to give us, your readers, access to the best medicine available. So <laughs> I'm looking forward to reading it. The name of the book is The Fun Habit. Uh, I am curious, what prompted you to write the book? Yeah, so I've been focused on positive psychology for some time. I'm a charter member of the International Positive Psychology Association, which um came about around 2008. And the reason for that was that at that time, psychology had really been about treating mental deficits. And so there was this new emerging sort of class of psychologists that wanted to use the tools of psychology just for betterment, you know, for folks that were looking to live more rich, fulfilling lives. You know, this term we often refer to as flourishing. And so I had really put a lot of those tools of positive psychology in my life, things like mindfulness and meditation and gratitude journaling and things that still have a lot of utility. But what had happened over the course of, you know, over a decade was that I had really kind of over-optimized my life for happiness. And in 2016, I had a kind of series of unfortunate events. My younger brother suddenly passed away from a pulmonary embolism. Um, I had been a longtime endurance um, enthusiast, not a professional athlete by any stretch, but I had done a couple Ironman and a ton of marathons. And I found That's out- That's pretty impressive. I had found out that I had, uh, it, it was a surprise that I had advanced osteoarthritis at a fairly young age and needed a hip replacement. And so when you get a hip replacement at a young age, they essentially tell you, you shouldn't run anymore because you know, you're putting car parts in your body, right? So all of these have, you know, hips generally last like 30 years, but if you're, you know, in your forties, that means you might need a, a revision later on in life. And that generally doesn't go as well as the first replacement because they're cutting through scar tissue and things of that nature. And so I was, you know, all of these unfortunate things happened, which, you know, in the rear view mirror, I really should have taken some time to sort of process those emotions and um, unpack, you know, what was going on and, and mourn my brother's death and mourn the fact that my identity, you know, was changing because I identified as a runner and I wasn't one anymore. But instead, I was trying to will myself to be happy. And so around that time, serendipitously, um, emerging research was coming out that, especially in the Western world, this ideal of happiness, so folks that are overly concerned with happiness, which is an important distinction to people that value happiness, so wanting people to be happy, wanting people to thrive, you know, the, the concepts of kindness are certainly, the, those are all still very positive things, but there's this, you, now there's a common term for it called toxic positivity, but this, you know, kind of insistent um, idea that, you know, good vibes only are, are the way to live are really causing a lot of folks um, to uh, kind of fall into despair because what happens, what we now know from science is when, you know, you see all of this motivation around you and there's a dissonance, you know, with regards to your ability to 
um, execute on that motivation, it can really lead you to start to question everything. Um, so much so that, you know, when you see happiness off in the distance and you identify where you are, and so that happiness, you know, there's this big gap between, you know, where happy is and where you're at, um, it, it can encroach so much on your identity that finally subconsciously you start to identify as unhappy. Well, I obviously, you know, I'm just not going to be a happy person, which is for most people far from the truth, right? And so I, it, there was this moment of self-discovery, which I talk about in the book, like, okay, wow, I've really been, you know, my own worst enemy here. So if I can't chase happiness per se, what can you do when you're going through you know, the challenges in life, whether it be the loss of a loved one, a divorce, a career change, you know, for instance, because those are big losses too, right? And so, um, and what I found is that no matter what your emotional state, most of us still can go out and organize our lives in a way that do bring us joy and delight. And so that was kind of the first insight. But then what I found is how many of us, especially in the modern world, have habituated a life that isn't joyful at all you know um there was just a post on linkedin last week that showed 29 percent of the american workforce is so burnt out they don't they don't even know what joy means anymore right and we're second to last in, with regards to first world countries with our ability to take leisure and we know that folks that take leisure are better employees so the paradox there right is that the folks that are living a joyful life actually produce way more, but somehow we've gotten in this crazy loop that, you know, that busy quote unquote is work. And so we're burning ourselves out, but we're actually producing less. And so what I, you know, kind of unearthed serendipitously was that if you kind of take time off the table for yourself, you actually become a better worker or more productive if you're an entrepreneur. You're, you have a lot more fun. And then not only that, but it's contagious, right? Like the people around you start to feel more joy. And so I felt it important to write a book about it. <laughs> <laughs> and such, uh, thank you for sharing your story. I truly appreciate that. And uh, what a timely book, because coming out of COVID, we still see people suffering and uh, not knowing how to go past it. That's a definitely timely topic. I know you want us to read the book. And you did share a little bit of how you talked about your story, but what can what highlights can you share from the fun habit? Yeah, so there are two models that I talk about in the book. Um, one is the play model, and that stands for pleasing, living, agonizing, and yielding. And those are really, it's a four quadrant model to be able to easily organize your time. So pleasing stands for things that we can easily do that bring us joy. And that's generally the low hanging fruit because a lot of us aren't doing enough of that you know, so it's kind of trying to identify what are those things in your life so that you can integrate them back in. But living is really those opportunities to do something really cool that, you know, leads to some sort of betterment, whether that's mastery of a new skill, whether that's connecting with your spirituality, whether that's reconnecting with nature, you know, making sure these things can't happen all the time, right? Because they generally take planning and energy. But, you know, understanding how important those things are to our betterment over time, um, you know, just that gentle nudge and reminder it becomes important. But um, the other two are actually the most important because before, especially for someone that's burnt out, you know, just prescribing more things to do is generally in that uh, bucket of toxic positivity. So agonizing and yielding activities are things that don't contribute to our betterment at all that take up a lot of time in our lives. So the agonizing ones are generally things that we still have to do. I mean, it could be hard work. It could be, you know, um, domestic duties at home, you know, things that aren't really enjoyable and, and really do take energy from us. So for the agonizing ones, it's not about eliminating those because th then, you know, that would sort of, then fun becomes whimsical, right? And that's not, that's not the thesis of the book. But there are ways to often shorten those, to outsource some of it. Um, to make them more fun, you know, so you're kind of pairing them with things that are enjoyable. Uh, and then, but yielding is really the things that you can make some immediate improvements on. And those are generally things where we've habituated the activity over time. And so, um, you know, things like consuming social media in mass, you know, friendships of convenience, 
um, admin activities that for whatever reason we're still doing, but don't really contribute to anything like clearing our inbox for, for instance, when that doesn't really move the needle on, you know, professional endeavors, but it feels good. So you do it from seven to eight 30 at night when you could just kind of delete those, you know, you don't even need to look at them. Um, so things like that, uh, the saver system real quick stands for story editing, activity bundling, variable hedonics options and reminiscing. And those are all sort of tools that once you regain this agency and autonomy over your time, you can put them into play to kind of continue to build this fun habit. So we don't have enough time to talk about each one of those, but um, essentially it's just uh, you know another set of tools that you can use once you kind of regain control over your schedule. Well, these sound like two great models. Mike, as a program focused on career literacy, I usually ask my guests to choose a career term. Because of the fun habit, <laughs> I <laughs> chose for you a career term that's fun at work. Can we have fun at work based on your models and the book you wrote? Yeah, absolutely. So I think um, what I did specifically on the book, you know, I had... I was kind of at a crossroads and I had to take the approach of, do I want to speak to leadership about how to make a more fun environment or do I want to talk specifically to the individual, um, even though that might be a little bit harder, right, to unpack. And so I chose the harder route. And I think, um, you know, it really goes back to self-determination theory. How can you create a work environment for yourself, even if you have an employer that allows you to engage in the work that the way that you want to, right? So it's how do you create this autonomy and figure out, you know, opportunities for one um, kind of bundling activities to the things that you already have to do. So they become more enjoyable. So an example of that would be, you know, a standing meeting that you have with a couple close colleagues that you really enjoy that time together. Like instead of just, you know, week after week staying in the at the conference room, why not take some of those meetings, you know, outside or at a place that's more enjoyable as long as you're still getting the work done. Another important aspect is to make sure that you do take those breaks. So we know that people that have transition rituals, um, even folks, you know, non-exempt employees that are working throughout the day, you know, if, if you've grinded it out for four days, making sure that you reclaim your lunch hour, you know, kind of take a break, stop that algorithmic thinking, um, you know, really enjoy that time. Maybe it's reading a book. If you're a social person, maybe it's going out to lunch with someone that, uh, you know, either a, a work colleague. Um, and in the book, I suggest, you know, it, it's not necessarily a mandate, but, you know, potentially someone that's outside of your department. So there's no power dynamic or, you know, the um, propensity to talk about work at lunch. You know, it's a true just enjoyment of time in someone's company. Um, so there are all of these kind of tactics of how do you create the space so that just in general, the, the, you know, the entire work environment is more enjoyable for you. So how do you become playful, you know, with the work tasks that you have? How do you kind of recapture the time that is yours so that you're having fun outside of work so that you come back to work more joyful? Um, and then also, you know, how do you create sort of affinity with folks that aren't necessarily in your department? Because a lot of times we don't have fun at work because, you know, with direct colleagues, there's these kind of roles that we play, right? And there is social norms that you have to abide to. Um, and so, uh, yeah, there are plenty of great ways to have fun at work, but I think at the individual level, it's really how do you recapture that agency and autonomy so that you feel like you have the space to breathe and you're creating this psychological safety within that space so that fun can thrive. Because if you don't feel safe, you know, all of this is kind of predicated on that. You know, if you're always either burnt out or for whatever reason, you don't feel like you have a voice or you don't feel like you have control over your day. We know that lack of autonomy, not only is bad psychologically, but actually has a fairly direct line to physiological poor health as well. Thank you, Mike, for taking on this challenge. <laughs> uh, <laughs> these were all the questions I have prepared for you, Mike. Would you like to wrap up with one more tip or maybe a quote or something that means to you. So there's a couple things. I think one, especially because I know, you know, this is a, a work related audience, um, try to figure out what those transition rituals are, you know, in the in these days of knowledge work, right, where we're often, you know, still on a business call as we walk into the office, or we're answering emails, you know, till our head hits the pillow. What is it that you can do that signifies to your brain, okay, I'm done with work for the day, 
so that you can recapture your leisure time. And then, you know, based on the tools that I have in the book, how can you reclaim two to three hours a week and really integrate joy back into it? And that doesn't necessarily mean being selfish. Like even if you, you know, are in a dynamic where you need to be around other people, how could you create an environment with those people where you're integrating a little bit more fun, you know, taking the lead and showing people, you know, how to have fun. And so, you know, just these little nudges, just these little course corrections can have a huge impact over time. So I invite your guests to try both of those. One, a transition ritual between work and, and leisure time. And then two, um, you know, especially if you're not enjoying much time in the week, just trying to, you know, really be deliberate about recapturing, you know, two to three hours a week that are yours where you have control, even if you need to invite others to that, to your good time. Well, that's, this is a very good tip. And just a reminder, the fun habits, where can we find it to buy it? Uh, it's available everywhere now. So if you want to support your local bookstore, that'd be great. Um, I've been getting a lot of pictures. You know, this is all new for me. I'm a first time author, but um, a lot of folks around the U.S. have been, hey, your book's right there and, you know, right in the front. So I want to keep that going. Um, but if you like online retail, um, it's available anywhere you buy books online as well. So thanks for that opportunity. And then if you have, if you're just curious and you don't feel like buying the book yet, um, a lot of my work's available at michaelrucker.com. Thank you so much, Mike. And thank you uh, for writing this book and congratulations on completing it. It takes a lot of work to write a book. Uh, and thank you for being a guest on How to Get It Info. Uh, it was my pleasure. Thank you so much. You have been watching and listening to Hoda's Career Info, the program where career professionals from across the globe join me to empower you to succeed. Thank you to my guest, Dr. Mike Rucker. I hope the tips shared by Mike inspire you to find ways to have fun at work. Mike and I met on Twitter, which is also where you can connect with him. You can also find him on other social media platforms or on his website, michaelrucker.com. To let me know if you are interested in an opportunity to talk about your work, you can send me a direct message on my website, writecareerfit.com, where you can also sign up for my newsletter to stay up to date on the latest episodes. Remember to like, subscribe, share, and follow me on social media for more career info. I am your host, Hoda, and until next time, stay inspired and keep moving forward in constructive ways.